So, okay, so it's, it's my great pleasure to introduce the next uh, uh, speaker, invited speaker, uh, Gonzalo Navarro from the University of Chile. Uh, he's working in the design and analysis of algorithm and data structure, also data compression and data structure, among, among other things. He has a, a very long and impressive uh, publication list, which contains almost uh, 500 items. So it's one of the most uh, prolific and also most highly cited uh, in the country from Latin America. Let's uh, welcome The title of this talk is worst, worst Case Optimal Joints to Geometric Data Structures. Okay, thanks for the introduction. Thanks, Matt, for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, okay, I'm going to talk today about. Uh, this work is joined with some other people from Chile. It was published in uh, International Conference on Database Theory in 2020, and now it's in TOPS, the extended version. So what it's about is about database joints, more precisely, natural multi-joints, uh, which is uh, the most expensive operation in the relational algebra, and which has been subject of uh, a lot of optimization in, in database engines since the 60s. And uh, always this optimization assumed that if you have a multi join, a join between several tables, you would proceed pairwise. You, you, you would take two of the tables to join them, and then the result you will join with the third one, and then all the point is what I join first. And then if you have a join like this, what you want is to return all the triples, A, B, C, which correspond to the attribute. This is a relation R with attributes A and B, a relation S with attributes B and C, and T with attributes C and A. So the set of attributes is A, B, C, so you want the triples the elements, lowercase A, B, C, which belonging to its attribute set, such that A, B is in R, B, C is in S, and C, A is in T. Okay, so you, you, you can choose the order in which you will perform the pairwise joins and everything is about how I uh, order this so that the intermediate results are not too big. So I don't build the too big intermediate result set to finally end up with a small result. This is all the point. So uh, all this was uh, shaken in, in, in a, about this time, perhaps a bit earlier with what was it's called the AGM bound after the name of, of the author as Axelius, Brock and Marx. Uh, where the idea is that the AGM bound is, is the worst case bound, is the maximum possible size of an output. Okay, what, what, what kind of output? Okay, if you have your query on tables with those attributes and those sizes, but the content of the tables can be chosen adversarially, which is the maximum output size you can have, okay? If you manage to, to run your join query in time that is of the order of the AGM bound, then you are said to be worst case optimal, okay? There is some database where you have to do that amount of work because that's the size of your output, okay? No, it's not necessarily instance optimal. Maybe your database is way easier and you could do better, but there are similar tables where you have to, to, to pay this, this size, a, a, AGM at least. So if you are, you always take that time, you're of course this uh, And then for example, there are some surprises that this, this, uh, this joint, which is called the triangle query, there exists a possible database. Here you have attributes A0, AN for attribute A, B, attribute C, and the relation here corresponds to the edges, okay? So there is one pair that is A0, B0, another that is A0, B1, and so on. This is relation R, this is relation S, and this is relation T. And for this relation, no matter how you order the, the pairwise joints, you have an intermediate result of size n square. However, there is no way you can have an output for this joint that is bigger than n to 1.5. So the AGM bound is n to 1.5, and every every pairwise joint strategy may take n squared for, for, for a bad enough instance. Okay, so no 
Airways joint strategy is worst case optimal. This is the the the, 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 the revolutionary idea of, of this bound. Uh, so how how you derive this bound? How how you compute this bound? Con consider a hypergraph where the nodes the nodes are the attributes, and the hyper edges are the relations that connect all the attributes they contain. For example, this this is not the same word as before. This this is another word. You're joining R, which has attributes A, B, C. You have T that has attributes C, D, and S that has attributes B, B, E. So this is your hypergraph. Now, for example, now that R and S, those relations out of the three, cover all the attributes. This means that every tuple in the output must have some attributes that must belong to R, to some row of R, and the other attributes must belong to some row of R of S. So but that's, that means that at most you can have cardinal of R times cardinal of S tuples in the output. So this is an upper bound of the output size. Okay. Uh, this, this is a kind of integral edge cover. You choose a subset of the relations that together cover all the attributes, then the product of the sizes of those relations is an upper bound to the, to the output. Okay, it's not necessarily the best upper bound, this is what we will see next. But for this particular case, it, it, it is the best uh, worst case upper bound. Now, this is our triangle point, okay? The, the, the one from the beginning. So yes, valid upper bounds are R times S, S times T, R times T, all those are valid upper bounds because they cover all the, all the nodes and correspond to different integral edge covers. But there is another upper bound that does not correspond to any integral edge cover, which is the square root of the three sizes. And this is where the n to 1.5 comes from. And this is called the fractional edge cover. And this, this, this is a, a tighter upper bound which is not so obvious as for the integral edge cover that it also overbounds the output size. So in short, it means like, it means that you can put fractional weights to each table, like one half to R, one half to T and one half to S, so that the sum of the weights of the hyper edge that cover every node add up at least to one. So if you put one half to each of them, then A, for example, has one half plus one half. So that's one and the same for B and the same for C. So this is the daily fractional edge cover. And this then is, is, is an upper bound. So a fractional edge cover will assign fractional weights to each hyper edge so that the sum of the weights, okay, where is the same? And then the AGM bound is the minimum possible value of this product, all the involved relation to the power of the weight that you gave them. Every fractional discover is an upper bound, and the AGM bound is the least of those upper bounds. If you take logarithms on, on this, what you obtain actually a linear program that you can use to compute the, the, the AGM bound. So the AGM bound is the output of this linear program, minimize the sum of XR or log of the size of the database. These are the variables. So that the, the weights are non negative and the sum of all the weights of the relations that inside on each node is at least one for all the nodes. And so the solution on, on a given query Q and a database D is called row of QD, and the AGM bound is tells that the size of the output, which is written like this, the query of the database, the size of the output is at most two to the row because all these two logarithms based. Okay, so the, the output of the linear program which took logarithms is row, so the size of the output is two to the row. When all the, all the, well, the three tables have the same size in the case of the triangle query, this is indeed the optimal solution, which yields n to 1.5. Uh, 
there are several proof of these inbounds. Some are very clean and some are horrible, but, but they, they, they are good for, for other purposes. But maybe we'll talk about that later. So a clean one was given by Grotten Marx, and it deals on the notion of entropy of random variables, where we will use binary logarithm. So the idea is that we will consider X to be a tuple of the output, okay, which is chosen randomly from, from the output of, of the joint. So since it's chosen at, at, at random, then the entropy is the logarithm of, of, of the size of the output. And what we want to prove is that the entropy of this variable is at most the sum of Xi log Ni, where Ni is the size of the, of the I relation. And the X size are this rational solution to the, or any rational solution to the linear problem. Okay, so first uh, lemma that is used to prove this is called Scherer's lemma. Maybe, maybe you don't know it, I don't know. Uh, the lemma says that, okay, you have a set of random variables, X1, XM, and your X is the, the, the conjunction of all, all those, uh, the tuple of those random variables. And you can have subset of the variables, J, which J is just a subset of the indexes of the variables, and XJ are the variables. Okay. And now you have a set of those subsets. If it happens that every, every, each of those, each of those uh, variables or indexes appears in at least Q of the sets of the sets of big J, then the entropy of, of X is at most one over Q, the sum of the entropies of all the involved entropies. Okay, this is it's not difficult to prove. First, you write the joint entropy of all these variables as you order them somehow, and then you add the entropy of each one given the previous ones, right? Then the sum of the entropies of all those subsets of variables, you write them, each of them as this sum. I just replaced it this like this here, right? Now you increase the condition variables instead of having each variable of the set conditioned to the previous variable of the set, I condition each variable of the set to all the previous variables, being the set or not. So it's not anymore J1, J2, J2 minus one, just X1, X2, X3, and so on, okay? So if you condition by more, by more variables, then the, the entropy decreases. And then because each of these distinct variables is mentioned at least Q times in all those sets. This is at least Q times the entropy of that variable J given preconditioned by all the previous ones. This, this is nothing, we are exploiting this simplification, right? That now every time variable number five appears, it is conditioned to one, two, three, four. It doesn't matter what, which, which set you took it from. So, so you can do this, this step. And now this is just a representation and, and another way to write the joint entropy of, of all the variables. So with this technical lemma, you can prove the aging bound. You take the rational solutions to the, to the linear program and write them as pi over q for integers pa and everybody with the same denominator q. Say that you have the attributes one to n and the gi, and you call gi the subset of attributes corresponding to the relations. So x will be an output tuple and x, so gi will be the projection of the tuple onto the attributes of the relation ri. And J will be a collection where you will put PI copies of the attributes of each relation Ri. Remember that Xi is the way that the linear program assigned to relation Ri. So we will put, we'll convert this to integers, right? 
we will put PI copies of each of the set of attributes of the corresponding relation. Now, you can see that every, each of the relations, each of the attributes, sorry, occurs in at least Q of those sets, because precisely if, if, you, if you adapt for every relation, for every relation, the attribute, the number of, of copies that you are putting this relation, right? This is, if you write PI as XIQ, this is Q times this sum, which is exactly what the linear program ensures that it's at least one. So this is at least Q. And, and, and this, this is it. Now, now you have that every attribute occurs at least Q times in J. And then you use share lemma to show that the logarithm of the size of the database, which is the logarithm of the entropy, is at most one over Q, the sum of the entropies of all the relations that you put in J, where you have put PI times each relation X, J, I. And this is still working. Maybe, maybe. Okay. Um, Yes, the laser. Oh no, it's dying. I will go get you another battery. And you can can you just use the arrow for just just a moment? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I yeah, come sure. right back. Sure, sure. Very sorry. Okay, here we are adding up all the relations, but you have three copies of each x j i. And then what we are doing here is we are just putting Q inside. So PI over Q is inside. And we are overbounding the entropy of each relation with the, the, it, it's, uh, the logarithm of its, of its size. I think that logarithm is wrong. This logarithm is wrong. This logarithm is wrong. This is the entropy. Right? Okay, so so this is it. We, we are using the entropies as a, as a, just as a tool to count the sizes of, of, of the set, but then we are exploiting the properties of, of entropies. So this is it. This is the proof of the AGM bound. It is also interesting that this bound is tight. That means it is an upper bound to how how big the output can be, but it is a tight upper bound. You can build relations which are where the output of the join will be that big. And to do that, you take the dual formulation of the linear program. Okay. You can do, take the dual formulation of the linear program where you have to maximize these variables, which are now associated with the nodes and not to the relations. There are weights of the nodes and not weights of the relations. So that they are negative and, and the sum of all the values for every re relation, the sum of all the ways you assign to its attribute is at most logarithm. So this has the same solution of, of, of the dual linear program. And it corresponds to a database where the universe for attribute B is just the numbers one, two, two to the y, y of B. And each relation is the Cartesian product of, of its attributes. So basically what, what you are saying there, there is that when, if, if you take two to the power of both, you, you have that the product of the, of all those attribute universes is at most the size of, of the relation. So it ensures that you build a relation that is not bigger than, the, than, than, than those that you have for your query, but still the, the, the size, the size of the join they produce is the same row of the of, of, of the upper bound. So you can quite easily build relations that give you an, an output of that size of two, two to the row. So an algorithm is I say this say to be worse is optimal if it runs in this time order of two to the row. Where the tilde in the O hides the polylogs as we are used to, but it also hides 
what a, what's it's called data independent factors. For example, it can be a function of the size of the query, a function of the number of attributes of the size of, of the schema, the number of attributes of the database, and so on, but not, not uh, related to the size of the database. Basically, only only polylogarithmic. Uh, well, one of the most popular um, worst case optimal algorithm, because one, one thing is to set the, the bound and another is to find how to create a joint algorithm that meets that bound. Well, the, 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 there are several now. The first ones were very complicated as usual, but then they become simplified. And one of the most popular because of the simplicity is leapfrog try join, which runs in this time, which is two to the row, right? And then you have times the number of attributes, times the number of relations, times log n, which is quite good. Uh, so this is a very efficient algorithm. In, in deal runs, for example, in times n to three halves, one with some polylog, when you have the triangle query. So it will outperform every, every traditional data database uh, solver for, for bad instances. The, the problem is not time, the problem is space. For leapfrog try join to work, you need that every relation with D attributes be stored in D factorial tries, one per possible ordering of the attributes. I mean, you have to read every row of the database and insert it as a string in a try. But you have to do that for every possible ordering of the columns. Okay, and this is bad. Uh, there are other worst case optimal algorithms, but all, all have space problems. So, so, so this this is the the, the, the big issue with, with with this new trend of solving joints in worst case optimal time. So you, you you have the problem of an explosion in in, in the space. Okay, so this this is what what we did then. Uh, we we found a compact representation of the relation that uses essentially the same space of the data itself. It, it, it has an extra of two integers per tuple, two extra integers per tuple. It obtains worst case optimal time where not that the price is shown immediately there, the n became two to the n, okay? So it's, it's good when you have not too many attributes in the joint and uses a, a Completely different approach as as leapfrog trajan. Uh, leapfrog trajan basically what we do is instead of reducing the problem by performing pairwise joins and then you have fewer and fewer relations to join, it goes attribute by attribute. It first instantiates one attribute and in all the relation it intersects to find all the possible values that this attribute can have in the final output, which must belong to all the intervening relations where the, this attribute belongs. And for each value of the attribute in the intersection, it will go to the second attribute and it, it will find in all the involved relations, some of those that are already conditioned by the fair value of the first attribute, which are the possible values of the second attribute and so on. It will go instantiating attribute by attribute. When it has instantiated the whole tuple, that tuple belongs to the output. Uh, here is, is, is a different approach we, we, we can discuss later because it has some similarities and it can also be extended to Boolean queries. And joints are a kind of intersection queries. Uh, it can also handle these junctions and negations and uh, it is still worst case optimal and can be extended to the correlational algebra. It's not worst case optimal anymore. So the idea continuing with with the quad trees of Conrado. Uh, it is that you will regard tables with D attributes as point sets in a D dimensional space. And we represent those points using a D dimensional quad tree. Um, for example, here you have this is a relation, relation R, for example, <coughs> that was A and B. And you have a pair that is. Um, Four comma three, then you have this one that right. You you, you have relations as point grids in the D. 
and the representation in the world view. You have the rule it has four children, which corresponds to the four quadrants. In this case, it was two dimensions to the two to the two. And then, for example, the fourth is empty. The fourth quadrant is empty, so you have a loop there in the, in the world tree. And the other three are recursive split. Uh, if you see, for example, this point, the red point, which is pretty tall, it belongs to the second quadrant. Which has number zero one there it's a channel of the root. Then within the second quadrant, it belongs to the second quadrant again. So it has zero one, which is second child. Then within this quadrant, it belongs to the third quadrant, so it's one zero, and then within that is one zero again. So you have this this is if the the value is zero one, zero one, one zero one, zero is called the more code of the of the, of the pair. Which is obtained by interlacing the bits of the, of, of the coordinates. Right. Uh, so the quad is essentially a try on the Morton codes of the points. Uh, so we have we used a representation, a compressed or a compact representation of those quad trees that allow you to traverse in constant time from parent to children. Ah, okay. So, we represent relations this way. What is the plan? The plan is that you will convert the join into an intersection. But to do that, you have to put all the tables in the same universe. I want to put the three tables in the universe ABC, in the three dimensional universe ABC. And then I will be able to intersect them. And this is the join. So this means that for every point in R, I will cross it with all the possible values of C, okay? And here we cross it with all the possible values of A and so on. So this part, which, which increases lift the dimension of the table is called extending, and then you intersect extended tables. So this is the idea of, of, of extension. Graphically, you have this smaller tool Two dimensional relation represented by this quad tree, you extend it to three dimensions, and then you will be able to intersect these things. The problem is that doing this explicitly creates a lot of redundancy. This is actually some, some or, or, or postdoc minus to, or to draw this, which is amazing. Uh, you, you have which would be the corresponding quad tree representation of this three dimensional thing. But this has a lot of redundancy because, for example, the, the two, the four octants on the front are identical to the four octants on the back of this cube. And then you have that this part, this sub three is identical to this sub three. And this occurs inside. If this part, for example, ends up occurring a lot of times and the blue one too. So you have a lot of redundancy and you create something that can be much bigger than the, than the AGM bound. So you don't want to do this explicitly. What we will do is uh, we create what we call the QDAP. The QDAP is a quad tree plus a mapping function in a way that the QDAP represents a higher dimensional quad tree, but it represents it only with the original quad tree and a function for mapping the coordinates. This mapping function says, the first octant of the QDAC is the first quadrant of the quad tree. For example, here, the first, if you want to go to the first octant, you go here. The second, third, and fourth octants are the second, third, and fourth quadrants of the quad tree. But the fifth octant is the first quadrant again of the quad tree. If we apply this mapping, not just to the root, to have to represent this, this quad three that has four octants and then four octants that are identical to the first four. But you always also do this in every internal node. You are representing this three-dimensional quad three with just the two-dimensional quad three and the mapping function. And you create this in, in, in basically no times, just additive two to the B. Okay. And the extra space is also an additive two to the B. Okay, this is the first part. The second part is the intersection. 
intersection is quite easy. Basically, you navigate, you virtually navigate the quad three of the output. Okay. So you have all these MQ dots that you are going to intersect, represent these relations, L is the grid side, and the output is the quad three representing the intersection of all those relations. So you take the value at the root. And if the grid is of side one, that means that you are talking about cells, individual cells. So you just return the, the minimum because you're intersecting. If, if, if every cell is present, then you return yes, otherwise you return no. Uh, otherwise, if there is some empty submatrix, you return an empty submatrix because you're intersecting all the submatrix. Otherwise, you consider all the two to the end child, children, which was already before somehow. You go recursively to each child, each of the two to the end children. And then know that you come here only if all the submatrices have something. If any of them is empty, you don't enter. You, you, you know that the output is empty. But if all of them are non empty, you have to enter. But still, it can be that at the end, after the intersection, the intersection is empty. So you take again, if all the values are zero, then the intersection is empty and you return also a leaf. You don't return a subtree. Otherwise, you return the code tree with the children you have just computed. So I'm, I'm, I'm emphasizing this part because it will be important soon. So the intersection algorithm is very simple. It's just a recursive traversal of, of, of the output. Uh, and we will show that it matches the AGM bound. And this is quite interesting because it's totally different from the previous way of, of matching the AGM bound. Why it is not instance optimal? It's not instance optimal because it may be, as, as, as I showed, that you enter into all the subgrids, you work a lot, and at the end, the output is empty. So you, you didn't work time proportional to the size, size of your output. Okay, it's not instance optimal. The work is actually proportional to the uncompacted result. There is, if you remove this line, if you remove this line, you will produce a tree, a quad tree, that is correct, but it is uncompacted. Uncompacted in the sense that you have subtrees and the subtrees have nothing. You go deeper and deeper and there are no points, but, but you have all the structure and at the end there are no points. You can work with that. It does represent the points that there are there, but it's, it's, it's not a correct quad tree in the sense that the quad tree should have a leaf when the submatrix is sent. So we say that it is an uncompacted quad tree and they, the amount of work you do is proportional to the size of that uncompacted thing that, that, that you must compact to, to deliver the correct result. So this is the line that actually does the compaction. It checks that everything is empty and then remove them and, and you become a leaf, not with, not with those empty children. Okay, so it's clear that it's not instance optimal, but then why is it worst case optimal? Because we, we can show that there are grids where the uncompacted result is the output. So if you work that amount of steps, there is an output where those steps lead you to actual points in the output. So it, it, it may be necessary. So this is the, the whole idea. You start with, for example, for the triangle query, you start with the three binary relations. You extend them to three dimensions, right? And then, let me see if this works here, not that it will work. And then you traverse the three of them in synchronization. And this is, this shows all the points that you consider when you do the intersection. From those, maybe just a few belong to the final output. So the amount of work you do is proportional to the number of shaded cells here. To be instance optimal, you would have to work proportional to this, but this, this is really difficult. No, no, nobody knows how to, how to be instance optimal for, for regenerate joints. Okay, so the result says that if we have a joint between M relations 
over n attributes and with a universe of size 10, then you can store the relations within this space for every relation star i, for every tuple, you will store the number of attributes plus two, plus uh, times log l bits plus something that's very small. And you can compute the join in this time, which is worst case something, even if, if, if we are adjusting a little bit of, uh, a little bit of that, that n because it's exponential in the number of attributes. So a plain data representation would use log l bits for every attribute of every row of the relation. We, instead of this, we are using two more integers. How can prove our join optimality? Okay, we need two lemmas here. The first one says, okay, let Q be the resulting quadri of the join and Q plus be the uncompacted version of, of the result. So Q plus has more nodes than Q because you, you have not removed the, 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 the end with the same. So H, which is log L is the maximum possible height of those tries with, without compaction or with compaction. So the root is in level zero and the leaves are in level H. And let us call MK the number of nodes in the uncompacted tribe at level K. And we call M the maximum number of nodes in every level of the uncompacted result. So the lemma says that the intersection algorithm takes time two to the n m times big M, which is this, times the head. This is not very difficult to see because at, at every level we, we, are, we are traversing, we are producing basically Q, Q plus. This is what we are traversing. We continue traversing all the Q ducks as long as they are all non empty, right? We generate the corresponding nodes in Q plus, in Q plus, even if some of those will disappear from the final result, but we, we work in generating that. So the cost incurred in the leaves and integer nodes, you can charge it to the to the parents, right? Which is always an internal node. And the number of steps that you perform in every internal node is two to the n, n, because you try for every possible children, every possible child of which there are two to the n, you intersect the n relations. So, so you take this cost for every internal node of this tree. So the number of nodes is just, the total cost is what you pay per node, times the number of nodes, which can be upper bounded by the biggest of them times the number of clients. So this is quite easy. A second lemma says that there exists a relation that is as bad as the amount of what you, you do. You say, okay, there are, you have the joint relations, the quad trees, the number of attributes in the result, the extended relations, your output, which is the end of the extensions, and Q plus is the uncompacted version, and M is as before, the maximum number of nodes in a level of this. Then there exist relations, there exist relations, which are over the same attributes and up to the same size, so that the, the Q dag of the result, of the compacted result, the, the actual result of the chain, has at least M points, has at least M points. So if, if you work, some function of M, some, something that multiplies M, then there is a relation that actually has M points in the result. And to do this, we basically, we take the, the level that produces the maximum number of nodes, right, in the, in the result. And if it's at, if this level is J, we create new tables where all the points belong to a small submatrix at depth J. So we put all 0, 0, 0, 0, 0 in the beginning. And the final J levels are the first J levels of, of each relation. So the Q1 prime is K minus J zeros. And then the exact same sub tree you will find here. And you do that for all the intervening relations in the joint. And then you can see that when you traverse this and you compute the output, when you do the intersection of this, after you expand and intersect, what will happen is that you will have in the output the same zero, 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 and the result that you will have here is exactly the same result you have here. 
with the difference that now these are not just intermediate nodes. Those are final cells. So if you build these relations and you produce the joint, the joint will actually have this number, big M of cells, not just internal nodes. This will be the size of, of the output. Uh, okay, so this is the proof. So with, with this, this is immediate now. Whenever the algorithm takes this time, there exists a database where the output of the query has endpoints. So you, you conclude that the time of the algorithm is the maximum size, possible size of the output times the other terms, two to the n, small n, h, which is log n. Okay, so uh, this is the, the main result then. Uh, other, other things that can be of interest, for example, if you have a cluster data set, it, it is known that what is used less space when, when the points are clustered. So we were interested in knowing if that better compression translates into better joint time. And actually it does, it's not that impressive, but it is something. So uh, it is not that if you have P points in the, in the grid and those distribute along C clusters in dimension D where every cluster has side SI and contains PI points, then the number of nodes in the quad tree is something that is a, a, a price per cluster is for every cluster you pay two to the D log L. But then every point pays only the number of bits needed to locate it into its cluster, just log SI bits. I will skip the proof. And if that happens, we can show that our join algorithm has, takes a time that, again, has a part that corresponds to the clusters, which is basically the AGM bound of of the database pruned at, at, the, at the first S levels. Okay, this is a simplified version where all the clusters are side S. So at, at, at level at the at the level where the subgrids are of side S, you prune there, and then you, you have the worst case time for that smaller database. And then the usual price. But here, instead of log L, you have log S. So this reduction in size translates into reduction in, in joint time, which is quite interesting. Okay, for extending to more general formulas, we first uh, show how to support, apart from joints, unions, intersections, which are almost, which are easier than joints, right? You don't have to extend unions and negations. And for that, we, we extend the QDAX with the concept of lazy QDAX, which are basically the, the syntax tree of, of, of the expression, right? We, we, we have, for example, here, R join S join not T. So this is the syntax tree of what, what you have to do. You have to extend the quad, the quad tree of R to ABC, extend this one, do the end, negate the one of T, extend it, and then do, do the end. And then it's lazy because you never materialize the output. You just give a way to traverse the output. I mean, I can ask to, 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 this, to this expression, I can ask, okay, what happens if I go down in the output to the first uh, submatrix, to the first sub, sub So for example, if, if you want to descend by here to 000, you will ask this one. This node will obtain from here this zero, zero, zero is this zero, zero, and this zero, zero. And this means that there is something there in those matrices. So it will answer one half, which means there is something. But this one will find that it is full of stuff here. So uh, this represents a full submatrix. So it will say, okay, this is full. And because it is not, then this is empty. And then, because this is an end, I say that this is empty. And I can answer that this is empty without ever entering into the details of what is here. Okay, so this is the idea of lazy QDAX. 
And with this, we can prove that, okay, we have to redefine what is the AGM bound because the AGM bound was defined for Jones, but you, you can easily extend it to mean the maximum output size, right? Of your expression on some tables of that size and, and matrix. And we still that can match the AGM bounds for ORs and NOTs with the sub restriction that we have to push the knots to, to the leaves and we cannot have R and not R in the in the list of expression for the same R. I mean uh, we can also express selections and projections, but then it's not op optimal. So okay, this is the theorem for general Boolean formulas. And the interesting condition is that you cannot have sub-expression sum for three q and the negation of, of q. Otherwise, it's pretty much the same. So the proof for that is, is uses the same ideas as, as we did for reasoning in Q. Q plus is much more complex now because of the negations. Uh, it's, it's, it's quite messy. Uh, but okay, if, if, if you're interested, the, 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 the paper is just out. Dot. And this is it. Thank you. Other questions? Any questions? Uh, thank you. Uh, so the experiment that we have to do, we know it's a minimum or it can be to the size of the oil. If minimum four? Um, I mean, so the Shannon is going to be able to do Yeah. Like it's a minimum related to the Yeah, but the, the, the thing that we, we are assuming we, we talk of Shannon entropy, but what we mean is the entropy of randomly choosing uniformly at random an element from the output. So there then the entropy is just the logarithm of the size of, 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 of the output. Oh, is the minimum number of bits that you need when all are equiprobable. Okay. Right. So, so we're, we're, we're using it as a tool to reason about the sizes of the sets, right? The, 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 there are no probabilities involved, actually. But there are useful lemmas on entropy that, well, that we can take advantage of. Any other questions? I think there are some online. There's a question here. So Jeremy Barbe wants to know about the definition of instance optimality. Oh. <laughs> okay. Uh, yes. For, for in instance of optimality, I meant it is probably too optimistic that you take time proportional to the size of the output. This this this, this, is, this is probably uh, more than than what is than what is possible for for, for instance optimality. I mean, it's, it's like an optimistic definition. I'm sure that Jeremy has a better one. Oh, he's then. Yeah, he's the right thing. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Any any other questions? About all that? I, I think that's all the all the online questions. <laughs> Yeah, I think nobody has their hand up either. Last question. Yeah. Where is the question? Thanks for the question. That was really good. No, then let's let's go. Uh, let's thank uh, Gonzalez again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.